January 7th, 2002. It's about 7 o'clock in the morning when my wife Rachel, in the back there, we're just waking up, and we hear this. It was the FBI. They raided our home with a search warrant looking for anything and everything they could get their hands on related to my boss and his company. I would soon discover that I would be spending 33 months in a federal prison for a crime I didn't knowingly commit because I had blind spots. Today we're going to look at your blind spots so that you can have better relations, better communications, and hopefully stay out of prison. And I think we'd all agree staying out of prison is a really good idea, right? All right. Story goes back a little bit further than that. As Stephanie mentioned, I was blessed in the uh, late 80s, early 90s to own the 13th largest Century 21 real estate franchise out of more than 6,000 offices in the country. And that little bit of notoriety led to an opportunity to do some keynote speaking and share with the inter internet or the real estate industry where the internet was going to take us as an industry. And from that five speaking events that I originally had, it turned into 14 states and then it turned into a national speaking circuit and I eventually sold my real estate company. While I was on the road, I developed a, a small dot-com company, I realized that I could help these real estate people get themselves positioned on the World Wide Web, and this wild, wild web. And in that process, not knowing anything about programming, but hiring all the people that knew about programming, uh, I was able to develop it in such a way that it, uh, we ended up selling it to the number two real estate portal in the, in the industry back then. It was called Home Seekers. Well, Home Seekers was a publicly held company. What that means is they had a stock on the stock exchange, right? And so they offered me a, a ton of stock and some cash and a, an opportunity to become the president of one of their divisions. And I thought this is like an entrepreneur's dream come true, and it was awesome. And so I felt like I was just levitating off the ground. I was like at the peak of my game, and, uh, and I just, it, it was during this craziness of the dot-com. About 10 months later, when the dot-com bubble burst, it means that it went into the toilet, so did my stock. Because I was with a publicly held company, my stock as an insider was restricted stock, so I couldn't sell it. Uh, but I learned really quickly uh, a term in the stock market called margin. What that means, if you haven't figured that out, is I could borrow money against my stock portfolio. How cool is this? So I was in debt really quickly. And when the dot-com bubble burst, I couldn't get out of debt quick enough. I couldn't pay off my loan to the stock brokerage. So the little Pac-Man just came and ate my portfolio. I ended up with almost nothing left. So I was a paper millionaire for a brief moment. Paper and brief, by the way, were the key words there. It was a lot of fun while it lasted. But I still felt like I was at the top of my game. And then it was the next opportunity that blindsided me. I was having coffee in a... In a coffee shop, you know, the ones with the green umbrellas. They didn't pay to sponsor this event, so we won't mention their names. <laughs> we, we were in the Northwest, where they were from, actually, in Seattle, and my buddy from church and I were having coffee, and we were talking, and I'm sharing my misery with him, and, you know, we just lost everything, had a little bit in the bank, and, and the conversation went kind of like this. So, Kev, wow, man, I feel horrible. What are you going to do next? Well, Scott, yeah. You know, I've got just enough seed money. I think I might just start another real estate company here in the Northwest. It kind of worked out really well the first time. Why not? He goes, yeah, you know, I, I totally get it. You know, it, it's just dawned on me. If, if you're interested and if you've got enough cash reserve, you know that I'm invested in five pre-IPOs, right? Now, I knew just enough about the stock market, remember, to be dangerous, and I lost all my portfolio. But I knew one thing, that pre-IPO was a big deal. So I'm thinking, yeah, you, okay, where are you going with this? And he said, listen, if you're interested, I can talk to the treasurer of one of these companies because he's a good friend of mine, and they're getting ready to go public in just a few months. It could set you back on your feet. I mean, it could turn everything around for you if you're interested. Scott, are you kidding? Pre-IPO, and I mean, they're going public in just a couple months? Yeah, I'm very interested. Make the call. So Scott makes the call, calls the treasurer of this company. The treasurer apparently calls the CEO. They pulled some strings, whatever that was, behind the scenes, and I get a frantic phone call from Scott a couple hours later. 
Cap, Cap, dude, you're not going to believe this. I talked to Donovan. Donovan said, no problem. He got permission to sell you no more than 10,000 shares of stock. They can't sell you any more than that because they're, they're cutting it off. They're going public. Scott, I mean, that sounds really cool. What's 10,000 shares going to cost me, though? He goes, it's only a dollar a share, so $10,000. It's going to, uh, and, you know, they're supposed to open in NASDAQ somewhere between $18 and $22 a share. $18 and $22 on my dollars? Now, Scott, I didn't do well in math, but I can figure this out. That's a lot of money. Well, I'm a little skeptical. I want to talk to this guy. So Scott set up the appointment. So he and I drove over to Bellevue, Washington, and we met with Donovan, the treasurer of this soon-to-be multi-billion dollar preventative health care company that was going to be going public. Well, I asked Donovan all the questions I can think to ask, not being the brightest bulb in the barn when it came to math and, and stock markets. And so it satisfied me. I, I, was, I was pleased. And so I pulled out my checkbook, and I wrote a check for $10,000 to the company. I became the proud owner of 10,000 shares of stock. Now, side note, whenever we make a major decision in our lives, here's what we do. We justify and rationalize how smart we really were right then and there. That's what we do. So, of course, I did what we all do. I just started realizing how smart of a decision that was. I started now researching the company even more in depth. I started following them on, on the Raging Bull, on these forums back in, this was like early technology, right? The forums back in the late 90s. And, and it's going crazy. The company is blasting their, their name all over the marketplace. They've got buses driving all over LA. They've got signs all over Safeco Field where the Mariners play baseball. I mean, it's a big deal. And I'm getting excited because my $10,000 is about to pay off in just a few months. Summer was awesome. We just lived on this high of the emotions of getting, you know, getting back on top of the market until about September when another frantic phone call from Scott came. Kev, Kev, dude, you're not going to believe this, man. The CEO heard about your business development background. He wants to talk to you because he needs a consultant to help him with a small project before they go public. Are, are you interested? It's like, oh, Scott, dude, I am, I'm going down the path of starting my real estate company. I don't know if I want the distractions right now. He, frankly, I was just playing coy. This is a multi-billion dollar CEO, I'm thinking, right? He goes, oh, come on, just take the call. All right, Scott, all right, I'll take the call. Have him call me. So now I'm driving a few hours later. I'm going into Seattle. I'm crossing over the 520 bridge, which is crossing over Lake Washington. And as I'm getting on the other side of the bridge, I get the call. It's Lawrence. It's the CEO of what's in my mind as a multi-billion dollar preventative health care company. So he and I are talking. He's sharing with me the, the, what he needs and the history of the company, where they're heading, and the fact that Shaquille O'Neal was one of the licensees of the company uh, product that they were going to be selling, that, that Kobe Bryant was involved, that John Elway was involved, that, in fact, the new CEO, when they go public, uh, who was going to replace this guy, Lawrence, the new CEO was Charles Dillman, Dr. Charles Dillman. He was the former head of the International Olympics Committee. I mean, big names, and I am levitating. Oh, by the way, I did pull over to the side of the road during this conversation. I want to be, yeah, be clear. And so after about an hour, I was levitating. And I didn't, I don't think I drove home. I flew home, right? And so I go barging through the door of, uh, of our house. And I'm like, Rachel, Rachel, you're not going to believe it. I just got an, uh, an offer from the CEO to help with a consulting project. And, and, and she's listening intently and perplexed. And, and I'm like, listen, he wants to pay me. $15,000 for 30 days of consulting to help him with an investor relations division. He said, and so I'm going on and I'm explaining the role and, and everything. And he basically just needed some help to systematize this, this division because they didn't really have a system. They had a voicemail machine. Uh, and <coughs> you don't even know what that is probably. He had this little machine that answered the phone. And it was, so they needed something more systematic so they could hand this division off to the new publicly held company. Well, I'm explaining this to Rachel, and I'm fired up, and she looks at me like this. Huh. Like, what do you mean? You ready? Here it is. Whatever makes you happy, darling. <laughs> Words of wisdom, right, men? Yes. I didn't listen to her. I took the consulting gig. That 30 days turned into 15 months working for this guy, and I never once saw prison coming. 
Welcome to the blind spot zone. <laughs> you see, we all have blind spots. In fact, you all have blind spots, and I'm going to prove it to you right now. How does that sound? You have a bookmark that you were handed when you got in here. Does anybody need one? Oh, we have several. Let's get some, some of these bookmarks handed out here. Thank you. We're back in the back corner. Pass them around. Pass those back to behind you, too. Okay, does everybody have a bookmark? Grab this, grab this bookmark with your right hand so that the X is slightly to the left of your thumb. Okay? Now, extend your arm out in front of you as far as you can and close your right eye. Stare at the X with your left eye. Now, bear this in mind. Stare only at the X, but you will see the white circle in your peripheral vision. While you're staring only at the X, begin slowly moving the bookmark closer until the circle disappears. Go slowly back and forth until, you, until it disappears. Don't look at the circle. It won't disappear. Well, some of you in the back over there are having way too much fun with this exercise. That's what's called a biological blind spot. We all have it. It's a place in the back of our retina that simply cannot receive light. Now, that's a biological blind spot. We all have biological blind spots, but you know what? We also all have psychological blind spots. And the first time I became aware of the idea that I even had blind spots was in my attorney's office. You see, after the FBI raided our home, I, I went down and immediately went and found a, a, a high-priced attorney in, in downtown Seattle. And it's like, what just happened? Oh, my gosh. And I explained the situation, wrote him a $5,000 check for a retainer. And then as soon as the money ran out, he let me know he couldn't help me anymore. <laughs> no. Well, that's about what the timing was. But he basically said, listen, he said, I got, I got bad news and maybe some okay news. And rather than playing a game, he just jumped right into the bad news. He said, listen, you are a target of the investigation. I was like, what does that mean? I mean, that sounds really horrible. He said, yeah, just it, they haven't indicted you. They're not arresting you yet or anything like that. But you are a target, which means that they're looking into whether or not you're involved in your boss's crime. And he said, so the bad news on top of that is I can't defend you because he said, if because you're a target, it's going to probably cost somewhere around one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars to defend you, and you don't have the money, because I didn't. And so he said, "But the better news is that I'm connected with um, a, a good friend down at the Federal Public Defender's Office, and her name is Carol, and she's the number two uh, lawyer in the Federal Public Defender's Office. And I, I can get you because you're a target. I can get you assigned early, if you would like." Now, I don't know about you, but Federal Public Defender, I've seen enough TV. I didn't get at all excited about this. Um, but it was my only choice, and so he connected me with Carol. Now, when I met with Carol multiple times in this first 30-day window, it was horrible. Carol brought me to tears. I felt like uh, I was just scum of the earth because of the way she treated me. I felt like I had already been tried and convicted by Carol. And, and I found out later that it was, she had to do this because she was really testing my resolve and she had to know what the truth is so that she could defend me, but it didn't feel good. So I'm about to enter her office again after about 30 days dreading the very conversation and it sounded something like this. We never even got to her to sit down. We got to the edge of her desk and she was like, Kevin, are you gonna sign this plea bargain or what? You're not going to have much time. I mean, they're going to pull it off the table, and you're, not even, you're going to end up in court, and you don't want to do that. It's like, Carol, I am not signing the plea bargain. 
I did not know my boss was committing a crime, and, and I've watched enough law and order to know <laughs> that you have to have intent to commit fraud, and I didn't know. I want a trial by jury of my peers. I want, to, I want my day in court. She's like, Kevin, we've gone round and round about this. It, it, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It just dawns on me why you and I are not seeing eye to eye here. You're seeing all of this through a, a moral lens, and I, I'm seeing it through a criminal lens, and I get it. But Kevin, morally, I believe you now. In fact, I know that I can convince the jury that, that you didn't know your boss was committing a crime, but the problem is criminally, you're guilty because it doesn't matter that you didn't know that your boss was committing a crime. And, and so sadly, when, when I do a great job with the, the jury, the, the judge is just going to turn to the jury and it's going to sound like this, Kev. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, your job today is not to determine whether Kevin knew that a crime was being committed, but simply whether or not he aided in the actions of the crime because he's not being charged with fraud, he's being charged as a co-conspirator. And under federal conspiracy laws, only one person in the crime needs to know a crime has been committed. So you see, Kev, even if you didn't know, you, you were there and you helped. The minute you put those envelopes in the mail, you became a co-conspirator to his mail fraud. We can't win in a courtroom. Sign the plea. And this was the worst day of my life. This was the day that I realized for the first time that I actually really was guilty. I'm not innocent. I'm not playing a victim here. I was guilty. I did exactly what she said. I helped him by mailing things. I helped him by emailing. I, there's a couple other smoking guns in, in the whole situation you'll learn in the book as you read the book. And the best thing that came out of that day was this idea that I realized that two people can see the same exact event and have completely different perspectives. You see, you all thought you were coming to one event tonight. But the reality is there's probably close to 100 different events going on right this second because you all have your own very unique perspective. And that is where my journey of discovering my blind spots began in her office. So we all have blind spots. Now, the hardest thing is owning that and admitting the fact that we have blind spots. So I've broken down these blind spots into three different categories. Pop is how I like to remember them, and that is the presupposition blind spots, oblivion blind spots, and the preoccupation blind spots. And these are the three areas that we need to be careful of and stay alert with the rest of our lives. You see the presupposition blind spots? These are... Areas where we have a presupposition, we have an idea, we have a belief, we have a, a, an expected outcome that we walk into different areas of our life with. We believe things. Sometimes we believe things we don't even realize we believe. But we believe things and we filter the world as we see it through those set of beliefs, right? So... One of these areas that I really began to get fascinated by is implicit association. Now, psychologists Banaji and Greenwald have been studying implicit association for more than 20 years. There's actually a test you can take, multiple tests, if you go to Harvard's website, or you can just Google implicit association test, and you can find out if you, in fact, have an implicit association. Now, what this means is this. According to their studies and all of their tests over 20 years, a million and a half of these tests, about 40% of us, they, they, they say, have an implicit association. In other words, we have a belief that subconsciously runs contrary to what we think we believe. Let me explain it this way. Follow me in this riddle. A father and a son are in a head-on collision. Now, the father, he dies immediately. But the son is rushed to the emergency room where he's wheeled into the operating room. And while he's lying on the gurney, the surgeon comes rushing in, takes one look at him and says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. How can that be? Of course, yeah, it's, his, it's surgeon's his mother. 
But here's the thing. For possibly 40% of us, maybe even in this room, we had a moment where we had to raise our eyebrow, we had to stop and think, and we went, wait a minute, you said the father died in an accident. It's a simple formula. It's X equals Y. It works like this. Most of the time, we end up thinking that surgeons equal male. Or we might think that nurses equal what? Female. Or police officers equal, well, donuts, of course. <laughs> this is an implicit association. Now, my wife and I, we consider ourselves to be colorblind. We are very inclusive people. We, we just love people uh, from everywhere. I've got great friends all over the world. In fact, helping that technology project, I ended up working with people from all different countries, and it's been a fascinating journey. Until just a few years ago, about two and a half, almost three years ago, our son, who today is 27 and single, <laughs> oh, they, they, I heard some ladies go, hmm. <laughs> He's not a student here, I'm sorry. 27 and single, and he calls us up and he's telling us about his new girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> sorry to disappoint. And he mentions that his, her name is Jihan, and that she was born in Kuwait. Hey, I, that wasn't me. <laughs> and, uh, but that's what we did, exactly. And it was, so here we are, inclusive colorblind people, and he mentions Jihan from Kuwait, and we're like, oh, and our minds start racing, and we're like, oh my gosh, what happens if they fall in love, and they get married, and they have kids, and, and then they bring the kids over to dad, who still lives in Kuwait, and is Muslim, and we don't get the kids back. I mean, crazy, crazy thoughts, and we had to stop for a minute. We're like, what is going on here? Why are we thinking these nutty thoughts? And of course, we realized it was because of CNN. <laughs> Fox News, too. I got I to gotta throw them both under the bus. Yeah, but, but no, not by brand. It's just, it's just that our minds had been infiltrated by a lot of media hype, right, and a lot of media sensationalism, and we didn't realize that it was actually taking root and it was actually getting a foothold into our belief system. It was an implicit association. What beliefs do you have right now that could end up running contrary to what you think you actually believe? This is the point. We take a lot of presuppositions into our lives. You're about to embark on a whole new journey, an exciting new journey. You're in the midst of a great journey now, but wait till you get out of college, you've got your degree, you move on, maybe you get your next degree, or you go out and start your career, whatever it is. What presuppositions are you bringing in to your journey, right? We have a lot of assumptions and expectations that we, that we set. I remember Rachel and I just celebrated our 31st anniversary last August. Uh, it's amazing. I don't know how she did it. Uh, it just, I just came up with the five things not too long ago, so uh, she's a very patient woman. But we just celebrated 31 years, and I, I remember being where you're at, and, and right in your age, and, and her and I talking about our dreams and our visions and how we were called by God to go out and evangelize the world. And, and eventually I even bought the domain worldchangers.com and, and didn't realize how special that actually was at the time when I got rid of it. <laughs> Things that we regret, maybe. Uh, so, but we were dreaming, and we felt called, and we felt passionate about uh, going over and, and helping with orphanages. My wife is just a kid magnet, right? Kids just love her, and these are the things that we set out to life to do. Here we are 31 years later, and though we've touched lives a few at a time, we've never gone overseas, and we've never evangelized, and we've never helped orphanages in third world countries because our expectations were diverted. 33 months in a federal prison, for example, right? It's sort of like the, the story, if you'll remember from Acts 27, 26 through 28 roughly, where Paul is getting on this ship and he is out to sea and then this massive storm comes. Remember this one, right? Where and there's the, all the people on the ship are freaking out. I mean, they're, they want to kill Paul and all the prisoners and the guards are holding them back. They want to drop the lifeboats and they're like, no, if, you, if they do that, they're going to die, right? So he, Paul had a, a vision, but he had no idea. He was going to be 14 days at sea, not knowing whether or not they were going to make it. 
until the angel of the Lord made it clear to him. We are all going to have storms in our life. What are you going to do when the storm hits you? And believe me, the storm is coming. We all have storms at different levels and in different impactful ways. But here's the cool thing about Paul. He weathered the storm. He kept the faith. And he ended up on this little island of Malta, right? Who would have thought? And when he got there, the, the, the head of the island was sick deathly sick. Paul was able to pray for him, and he was healed. Paul ended up being able to pray for many of the islanders, and they were healed, but only because he was able to weather through the storm and realize that God had a bigger purpose and that God was still in even in the storm, right? We're all going to have our storms. I hope none of your storms land you in a prison, but if you ever do, go to federal, not state is what I hear. But all, all seriousness, seriousness, I hope you don't ever go to prison, but we're all going to have storms. Some of us are going to lose loved ones. Some of, us gonna, some of us are going to have our lives sidetracked unexpectedly. Keep your faith. Keep, keep looking up. Keep moving forward. Remember, there's an island of Malta waiting for you. You're going to get through the storm. What happens, though, is this, is we set up false expectations in, in, a, in a way that we don't realize until sometimes we look back. You sit where you sit right now, and you have these great expectations, but what happens when the storm hits and our expectation of how God should have come through doesn't meet up to our expectations? We create an expectation gap. And what we naturally do with this gap is we start filling the gap with all kinds of negativity, discouragement, disillusionment, frustration, you know, anger sometimes, you name it. And if we're not really careful, we can actually direct all that towards even God. Saying, well, God, where were you? Where were you in my dream, in my vision, in the call that you had in my life? I remember sitting where you're at and hearing a preacher come through our church on the college campus of UC Davis, University of California. And he was about 62-ish, Joe Smith, about 62-ish. And I was full of the zeal and wanted to go out and save the world, if you will, just be a, a tool that God was going to use. And he said these words that I never forgot. He said, young people, he said, I spent the last 35 years in corporate America. And the whole time I kept thinking, I thought my call, God, was to be in full-time occupational ministry. He said, now I'm in full-time occupational ministry at 62 years old, finally. And it was all good. It was an encouragement message, you know, encouraging message. But I remember thinking, oh, God, I hope that's not me. I don't want to wait 30 years. Well, I'm 55, so I got there just a few years earlier. But here is the point. We can fill this expectation gap with all kinds of discouragement and disillusionment. This is, works the same way in our relationships as well. The next blind spot area that we need to watch is oblivion blind spots. You see, there are a lot of influences that are impacting our decision-making and our behaviors right now that we are just simply oblivious to. We have no idea that these blind spots even exist. Self-awareness is one of the big ones. We lack self-awareness. Now, according to Tasha Yurek, she's a psychologist. She wrote a book called Insight not too long ago. She said that about 95% of us believe that we are self-aware. However, only about 10 to 15% of us actually are. Now, it's normal to feel this way right now. It's normal to think, well, yeah, I feel sorry for all those other people that are not self-aware, and I am. That's how we think. This is just natural. The problem is that we need to become more self-aware. We don't want to be like uh, the, uh, the man who stares into the mirror and walks away and forgets exactly what he saw, right? We need to actually become self-aware. We also have sort of a false expectation to bring that back into this message for a minute, sometimes about that, the way that sanctification works, the way that God transforms us. God is a, totally at work transforming us, right? But we also have a part to play in this process. We need to own that transformation, and we need to actually seek after 
that transformation. We need to want to become a better me or a better you. This is the beginning of self-awareness. Now, everybody, please, right where you're at, stand to your feet. Can we do that? Just leave your notes right where they are. We're going to do this orderly, but we're going to move you around for just a moment. Here's how it works, okay? And you're going to go back to your seats. If you would consider yourself a fast-paced, now before you answer the question, hear both answers. If you would consider yourself a fast-paced, more outspoken type of a personality, uh, then you're going to take some steps toward the front of the room. If you would consider yourself more of a quiet, more of a reflective, cautious type of a personality, you're going to take your steps up back toward the back of the room. All right? Make your choice. Do it now. Come forward or go back just a few steps. Make a line down the middle of the room, basically. All right, where did we decide to draw the line? Red shirt, are you the back of the room? Okay, back of the room over here. Who's the back of the room? Where's the first person in the back of the room? Start over here. Okay, gentleman in the gray suit back there? Okay, all right, now, one more question. We're gonna divide the room another way. So some of you in the back are just gonna end up staying in the, in the corners you're at, some of you are gonna move. If you would consider yourself to be a more accepting and warm type of a person, then I want you to actually move over to this side of the room and, if you, and stay in the group that you're in. And if you would consider yourself to be more of a questioning and skeptical type of a person, then I want you to move to this side of the room. Okay, go ahead, do it now. So stay in the current group that you're in, but separate from one side to the other. All right. And I'm the middle right here, so I'm the dividing line. This is just a quick test to determine the type of behavioral style that you, that you have. Now, bear this in mind. There's no good or bad style. Everybody has a style, a personality behavioral style. And this has been studied for decades, and there's millions of data points out there that really help us group these categories, right? Now, there's more than four, but there's four primary groups, and then there's blended groups. And we're talking right now about the primary groups. And I'm going to show you that sometimes we're oblivious to how we even interact and how we communicate and how we relate with one another. Now, this group over here, right? This group is what's considered to be the competitors. This is the competitor group. This is the group that, by and large, they want to, they'll get her done. Just let me know what I got to do, and we're going to get her done. In fact, we're going to do it in a very competitive way because they are driven to win. That is who they are. That's what really drives them. This group over here, this is our motivators. These are the life of the party group. These are the fun-loving group. This is a group that's like, hey, you want to hang out? Let's, let's, let's do something fun, right? Uh, this group, they are driven for expression. They love to express. This group back over here in the corner, this is our peacemaker group. Now, this group, they love harmony. They're all about harmony. They want to make sure that relationships are intact. They don't want any friction. They're all about teamwork. They're all about working together, right, in, in harmony. And then this group back in the corner, those are the analyzers. This is a group that they want to make sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed. They're going to double check, triple check, sometimes quadruple check their work to make sure it's right because they are driven for accuracy. You see, Dr. Mark Scullard talks about the fact that we all have these driving needs and we, we sort of frame the world somewhere between three and seven years old and we sort of look at the world, we try to figure out what makes it work. And so however we interpret the world at those young ages, that begins to be a driver for us. Now here's the problem and these are the blind spots we need to watch for. Because see, the competitors, generally speaking, they're get or done, right? Let's move fit and you know move quickly, and they can be very candid, right? They can say their mind, and those and sometimes they forget that there's feelings and personalities on the other end of the spectrum. And the worst 
enemies typically are the polar opposite corners. The peacemakers and the competitors naturally will, will rub each other if they're not careful because of the blind spots. So what happens is the peacemakers tend to wear their emotions on their sleeve a little bit more. They're very, I mean, they're, they love people and they love to be, you know, make sure that pe you know, nobody's offended or anything like that. Competitor walks in and just steps all over them. Or the peacemaker actually, because they want to keep the peace, will actually just kind of suck it up and, and take the brunt of it and they don't want to create friction. And so they feel like they're walked all over. Now the polar opposites here, the motivators and the analyzers, these guys love to talk. I mean, they love to tell the story, right? And because they're just about the life of the party and expressing and everything else. And these guys are the skeptics. These, they, and they just, they want data, right? So the analyzers, you go to the analyzers with an idea or something and you say, well, you know, these guys think it's a great idea. The skeptic is like, who are these guys? And where is your data coming from, right? So there's this conflict constantly going back and forth. Go ahead and go back to your seats. We'll elaborate a little bit more on this. <laughs> Thanks for playing. All right. What you just, hold those questions. What you just experienced was not scientific. It was just a basic concept of how to quickly identify who, which group somebody might be in so that if I know that I'm a competitor, then, and I, I can quickly identify that you might be a peacemaker, I can be more self-aware and realize, you know what, I, I can't be quite as candid as I would normally like to be. Uh, maybe I just need to be a little bit more in tune and sensitive to this person's feelings. Whereas if I'm talking to another competitor, it's like, there, we're on. You know, he, her and I are just like, get it done, talk, talk, bullet points only, right? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat a peacemaker slightly differently. I'm gonna adapt my style to theirs instead of expecting them to adapt their style to me. This is those expectancies and things that we're oblivious about. So we're, we're going to not have, uh, not go deeper into that right now, but I'm going to give you an address. Write this web address down if you would like. In fact, it actually is on your bookmark now that I think about it. So on your bookmark, you can actually take a free assessment and it will, with 14 questions, it'll tell you which, exactly which group you're in. It'll also give you, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. It will also give you a really good idea as to what potential blind spots you have in your behavioral style. And I just realized a blind spot that I had by not plugging in my laptop. <laughs> I don't know if there's even a plug nearby. Okay, so take those bookmarks, do the assessment when you can. One more point, and that is the preoccupation blind spot. There's a lot of things that can occupy our thinking. And because we become preoccupied, we can tend to miss out on the very important things that we are experiencing in life. One of those blind spots is what I call the occupational blind spot. We get so engrossed and so wrapped up in our career tra trajectory you know, we just want to go and excel in whatever we're doing, but we can get so wrapped up in it that we can completely neglect the people we care about the most. And we don't even realize it in the midst of this blind spot until sometimes it's too late. And sometimes you become one of the statistics and you don't want that. So when you're pursuing your career, keep these things in mind, keep pop in mind and keep this preoccupation blind spot in mind so that you can create a lifestyle that, yes, is honoring in your work, but you have to know what's important to you. What are your values? We do a values exercise in, in our full day of training, and, and here's just a quick example of what we do. We have people write down their top 10 values, the thing that they value most in their life. You can do this on your own. Then we have them whittle that list down to, to six. And then you start paring it down even more and you end up with your top three values that you decide, I'm gonna run all of my major life decisions through this values filter. 
what are your top three values? Something to kick around and something to work through. Because when you have to make major decisions like I made, I realized in hindsight that money was one of my top three values. I never vocalized it. If you would have asked me, I would have picked values out of the air. Oh, integrity is important, yeah, because you know Christian values, I just started listing them, right? Um, but I found out money was a, a top priority, is a high value for me as an entrepreneur, and it just was not a good value. And it allowed me to, to see things in a way that I shouldn't have been able to see them if I had clear, more clear thinking. What are your top three values? With that, let me open up the floor and answers. I saw a hand go up earlier, but who's got the first question for me? And you, here's the rules, by the way. You can ask anything you want about pop, or you can ask anything you want about prison and doing time, and that's okay, too. <laughs> I have nothing to hide. I'm guilty. I did it. I spent 33 months in a federal prison for a crime I didn't knowingly commit. Yes, sir. In hindsight, how could I have avoided making the mistakes I made? That's a great question. And only in hindsight now, I can actually say that some of the things that I teach uh, in, in our longer training and so forth are this. One is that you have to have people around you that you are willing to open up to and be transparent with. Transparency is key. Okay? You have to have people who will tell you the truth no matter how much it hurts them. Because most people don't like to tell you the truth because it's going to hurt them, and that they're going to hurt you, possibly. So find people who, who you can give permission to and say, listen, I have blind spots, and I want you to let me know the minute you see anything out of ordinary, anything out of character, anything that you think is a red flag, please bring it to my attention. And I promise I will listen to what you have to say and not take offense. So it's a two-way. You've got to find people you can do this with, and you have to own it. You have to be the one to do it. If I could have had some, some people around me like that, but I was moving too fast and too furious, and I was so stubborn and a little bit arrogant, and I thought I was at the top of my game when I sold my dot-com company, and the next, the next opportunity was just like I was just way too out there, so the friends I had around me I wasn't even listening to. So uh, did I, you know, I, I knew, I didn't think it was illegal at the time, but did I think it was maybe not a good idea? Uh, my wife certainly did. <laughs> uh, she did not think it was a good idea. And there, was, there were many flags, many red flags it, 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 that in hindsight, I look back and I went, oh my gosh, I, you know, I just, I missed it. Like the Lord was warning me in several, several cases, just common sense was warning me at certain times. But what happened is this guy was brilliant. The FBI called him the most cunning con man in the history of the state of Washington. And he was brilliant at what, what, the, what I call kernels of truth, stuffed with a lie. So he basically was, just kept us focused on all the facade and justified and rationalized every little red flag for us, and we just bought into it hook, line, and sinker. Because as long as we had a rational reason for the red flag, then it was okay. It's all it made sense. Yes, sir? Okay, so an example of a blind spot, and, and one of the smoking guns, I mean, if there's any, you know, if there's a reason that, that I ended up doing time, it was, it was one of, the two reasons, one of them was this, is about April of 2001, the FBI, I'm sorry, not the FBI, the state of Washington issued what's called a cease and desist, and what they said in the public, in the paper and everything, was stop selling stock, right, so it was, a, you know, basically barring the company from moving forward. I got a call from Lawrence, the boss, and he said, listen, I need you to go to a law firm in Bellevue and find a law firm that will actually help us set up a white knight. Well, not to bore you with too many of the details, but basically it works this way, according to um, what I understand about the, uh, the process, is that because the company was in violation, and the way he always put it, the boss always just used things like rules and violations. He never would say anything about laws. Uh, but because the company was in violations, he explained, we had to get a white knight. We had to have this other group of investors that had nothing to do with the company that were willing to come in, buy up all the stock, and absolve this company of its sins, so to speak. Um, and you may have seen this in like R.J. Nabisco's story and some you know, mergers and Wall Street type stuff. Uh, but this is what we're being you know, told. So I went to a law firm and found out, yeah, that's pretty much how it works, and we can do that for you. We can set up the LLC and show you how to do it. So we did. 
problem is the FBI said if you would have left, or the prosecutor actually said, if you would have left the company right then at the cease and desist, we wouldn't even be talking to you. But that should have been like the biggest red flag. The, you know, we're telling you guys to stop, and you kept doing it, right? So um, we have time for one more question. Stephanie, two? Two, two? okay. Yes, sir. Can I, as a Christian, hold money as one of my core values? So that's a, that's a trick question um, because of the way you worded it. <laughs> and you're probably known for that by the looks on these other people. You know, he's, he's got you. No, in this, in this sense, if you would have asked me what my values were, I couldn't have told you. And if I were to ask all of you right now, what are your top three values, I, I would bet that most of you couldn't tell me. Because you've, how, how often do we ever sit down long enough to actually think about what they are? We just adopt the Christian values because, you know, we, we follow in the, in the faith. So we adopt those. But that's different than what are our top three values I'm going to run all my, filter all my major decisions through, right? Now my top value is relationships. I value relationships. And if I, so as I'm making decisions, if I have a decision that affects my negatively my relationships, then it's not a good decision. And I filter my decisions through these values. So can a Christian hold money as a value? Money is important. Money is necessary. I personally don't think, for me, it's a value ever again. And I don't know that it would be a smart value regardless. However, here's the deception. I call this the altruism blind spot. Because the way we justify and rationalize this money value is all the good we're going to do with it. Oh, yeah. You know, God's called me to be rich so that I can, I can be like the little Debbie group or I can, you know, I can, right? I mean, I can, you know, donate land to all these good causes. And listen, I dealt with 5,000 investors as the head of the investor relations department for this company. And hundreds of them would call weekly and want to talk about where the stock was at, where the project was heading, and I heard it all. I heard how all of these investors were going to do all these really great things with their soon-to-come soon wealth because most of them had never had wealth of any kind because that was the biggest sin that this guy you know, broke originally years before I ever heard of him was that he broke the, uh, the rule where you can't have more than 35 unaccredited investors. In other words, the little guy, if you would, can, if I can use that old that term, in other words, somebody who really doesn't have the money to invest in high-risk stocks shouldn't be investing in high-risk risk stocks, and the SEC is really serious about that. Well, he had many more than 35. He had thousands. And so they, they all had the same deception. Oh, yeah, when, when I get my million, I'm going to buy a new library for my community. I'm going to buy this, and I'm going to do this. And... I just felt like asking in hindsight. I couldn't ask then, but I would like to go back and say, and you're going to keep the same house, drive the same vehicles, and wear the same clothes, right? Nothing for you. It's all going to be about all the cool things you can do with the money. Money's good. Money helps a lot of people. It's not evil in and of itself. It's what we do with it and where our heart is at with it. Yes, sir? What's your favorite part about prison? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part about prison? I have never been asked that question quite that way. But thank you for asking because it's actually, it's true. Now, I don't recommend prison for everybody, but prison was really good for me. Uh, and, and here's why. Because I was at the pinnacle of my career, and I had just, like I said, become a paper millionaire for a brief moment. I, was, I had reached what I felt was success in my ventures. The whole time, I was living a life of quiet desperation. I was in this rat race. I was moving a million miles an hour, like the speed of life, I like to refer to it. And I knew that I just needed some slowdown time to really reflect and, and sort of decompress. My dream was to have six months in a cabin with no people, no technology, just six months to decompress with my Bible and with God and just and reset. I had no idea I was going to get 33. But the best part of prison was just that I actually was a prison chapel clerk. So I, my job was to sit in the chapel and 
I got to meet with a lot of guys and, and counsel with many of them and uh, had full access to the library. And the best thing that happened for, in prison for me was the idea that, that it was just me and God, and even with 500 roommates that snored and everything else. It was just me and God, and it was a time for, for him to help me focus and understand my blind spots. And since then, this is now a calling, a mission, and a ministry for both my wife and I. We travel all over the country and even starting to go outside the country uh, sharing this message. Uh, <clears throat> I don't share it quite as overtly uh, because it's, they're mostly secular audiences, so this is a blessing for me to be able to be with the people of faith. Uh, but most of the time it's awesome because the people of faith in my audiences come up afterwards like, oh, there's a lot of Bible in your talk there, isn't there? It's like, yeah. Of course there is. Why wouldn't there be? Right? Great question. Stephanie? We good? Uh, I mean, I'll be here all night, so you guys just got, you got to stop me. That's right. They are all signed. You're all welcome to one. And if you'd like your name in it, I'd be more than happy to do that as well.